uh, the Coverager Studios of Naples, Florida. Uh, I got my new carpet behind me. I'm back in my office. Now I get to redecorate uh, like I should. Try to get it like my guest here, Brian Falchuk. Brian. Hey, up, how's man? it going? It's good to see you, Nick. Good to see you too. Uh, are you in an office? Like, are, do you, are you like basically wrapping yourself around with, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, types of green screens? It's not green screens. What this is, is when you uh, do a lot of public speaking and you are showing at events and whatnot, and those all get canceled, then you got all these backdrops and you nice. kind of want, you kind of want to hide the basement scene from everyone. So suddenly I get this branded covering of like staircase and toys and workout equipment. So it works nice. out well. No, it's good. Cause I, I was wondering if like, if you kick that in, is there like, will, will we see like, <laughs> you know, your, your, uh, 225 on the bench press. Yeah, maybe 225s. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, so welcome. Uh, this you. particular episode is uh, geared around um, some publicity for, yes. for a book that you have written. Um, I know a little bit about some of the details around it, but before we even get started on that, why don't you give yourself a proper introduction? Brian okay. Falchuk. Go. So I'm Brian Faltrek, and uh, as Nick said, um, I'm an insurance guy. Like you know, a lot of people who are on this show, uh, I'm 20 year PNC veteran. Most recently, I was a COO and then uh, chief claims officer for a carrier, um, two different carriers, and um, then I went to the insure tech side. So I'd been an early customer of this insure tech company called Hi Marley, and joined them for a year, helped them grow, and uh, I decided to leave at the end of the year to write this book because of what I was seeing. Having been on both sides of that equation, um, something became really clear to me about this moment that we're in in the industry. And this is my third book, so like this is what I do. I, you know, I think about things and I write about them and try to help people figure out how to navigate through situations they're in. And uh, I've never written anything in insurance before. It's always been in other spaces, self help and. The joke I make is this is self-help, but the self is an insurance company or maybe right. an industry now. Um, but there was a really clear moment that we're facing that's quite unique. And a lot of people, you know, being in a sales capacity at a tech company, I kept having the same conversations with, you know, different people in, in different roles in the C-suite, whether it's underwriting or claims or CEO or CIO or COO, they're all feeling stuck. And they're feeling stuck because of all this legacy baggage we have or the constraints we have all the typical things that we talk about in the industry is what holds us back, right? Our culture, the politics, regulation, IT, like whatever it is. Um, and at the same time, they're watching customers have rapidly changing and changed expectations because everything else they do in their life is different, right? It's all digital. It's all on demand. It's instantaneous. Like people are paying their rent or their mortgage, like, you know, like yeah. that. Uh, everyone I know who has Venmo who's over like 35, it's because of some rent transaction. Like that's how I learned about Venmo is like, yeah. It's like people are paying their rent through Venmo. Like that's, everything's just different. And then you go to insurance and it's like, we're one of those three industries where fax machines still exist. You know, it's like us doctors and lawyers and lawyers is sort of a crossover with perhaps doctors and lawyers, but we still, we're doing better, but we still do things a different way from what customers want. So carriers have that pressure on the one hand and more and more frustration from their customers for not meeting that pressure. And then the other hand, and this is, you know, the realm of coverages, all the startups that are coming out, that's not necessarily anything new. Like the term insure, insure tech is a newer word, but there's been tech and insurance yep. for years. Um, but if I go back to when I was starting the industry in 2000, lots of disruption around the idea that agents and brokers are going to be gone. It's going to be all these exchanges. And that was like, you spell exchange with just an X or like the letter E because no, the iPod wasn't out yet. So no one was using the letter I. It was all like E, e-commerce, E this, E that, E exchanges. And lo and behold, you know, Marsh and Aon and well, not Willis, but sort of um, locked in, Hub, like they're all still around. And maybe some of them aren't because they're part of someone else, but the agent and broker channel is alive and well. If, any, if anything, it's bigger. It's bigger. Yeah. yeah. And all of the, I mean, literally all of those exchanges are gone. None of those disruptors who were predicting the end of this antiquated channel are here anymore. 
the difference with the tech and the disruption going on right now, and this is the second pressure that carriers face is, yes, there's lots of enabling tech and it can change, you might say threaten, or maybe it's creating opportunities, the way that we work. Like, yes, there are exchanges now, there are aggregators and stuff, but a lot of them are not to displace agents and brokers. That's one of their customer bases. You know, they're there for direct sales, but they're also there to enable the intermediated sales. So you have a lot of new technology that's really about changing how we work. What's different is you also have tech enabled carriers. So you, this is the first time you've really had a slew and really high frequency of new carriers entering the market and they don't have a lot of the legacy constraints and they face regulation just like all of us in the incumbent world do, but they don't have the legacy IT debt. They don't have the same culture. They don't have, you know, tens of thousands of employees that they need to figure out how to work with. Um, so there's, there are these new players coming up that are threatening, might be too strong of a word, but certainly creating disruptive pressure on the incumbent carriers. And so when I talk to those incumbents, they're, they're frustrated, they're stuck. They're feeling like we've got these pressures on the outside and we can't act fast enough. We can't do anything, we're too far behind. And actually that's not true because tech is different today. You know, you hear innovation, it's not like 10 years, $300 million and you have all these SIs in and it's like miserable and you get like a 10th of the scope that you were hoping to get and three times the cost. Like that's not what innovation has to mean anymore. There are ways to move ahead. There are ways to meet those pressures, the disruption, the threats, the opportunities differently, more flexibly. And being on the side of one of the providers who was doing that and talking to these carriers who felt that way and then were like, oh, actually we can do something. And they tried it and they did and it had a big effect. I wanted to tell that story. And so that's, and, and actually Nick, you were the first person um, that I told this to. Like I called you up and I think I got maybe six words into a much more succinct <laughs> pitch like, of yeah. what the book was. You're like, I'm in, what, what can I do? And I was like, well, I haven't even told you. You're like, I don't, well, let's do it. Yeah. Um, well, you were so I'll, supportive. I'll, I'll tell you from my vantage point, um, cause you know, I was aggressively involved with uh, Rob Galbraith's book, the end of insurance. And um, I'm always eager when someone that has um, extensive background but like you're you're not old, right? You're so you you're closer to the digital natives, yeah, than yeah. the other side. So you're very comfortable in a world with computers and digitization, and so you because you're comfortable. I think there's your voice carries a lot of weight as far as I'm concerned because you can see both sides of it and you recognize, especially with your consulting background. Right. You recognize like you can you you are able to compute and put basically a return on investment mm. that is so desperately needed. Like the you know, a lot of these insurance executives don't want to move or get paralyzed. I think that was the word you used. That's the correct word. Like they yeah. get paralyzed by it. But at the end of the day, when it boils down, if someone can come in and basically be a trustworthy voice to give a dollar and cents figure return on investment. This is what you can expect. This is how you're, this is how it's going to change the culture of your organization. That voice needs to be amplified. So it's like, yes, I was, I was all in. No, you, you were great. Um, and you're right. I, sh I mean, I should said more on my background. Like, yes, I've been in the carrier side, you know, I gave a couple of roles, um, big carriers, small carriers, specialists, whatnot. And I was a consultant at McKinsey for a couple of years in the PNC practice. So yeah, I saw a lot of other carriers as well. People like, have you just been fired a lot? How do you see all these different carriers? Like, oh, some of it was consulting. So um, I've only been fired a little. Really, It's yeah. just uh, it's the consulting too. <laughs> We've but, all been um, fired and we all have bosses. Um, yeah. what, what, what's the name of the book? The book is called The Future of Insurance from Disruption to Evolution. Okay. And... Uh, you took a unique approach to the book. I it's did. Less, it's less narrative and, and focuses, I think, again, your consulting background really comes into play here. Talk about the approach that you took yeah. in writing it. So there's three sections to the book. The first one is me sort of summing up this situation that we were just talking about. You know, like what, what is the current state of affairs and a little bit about the past. So, you know, what was that year 2000-ish sort of point of disruption? what's going on today and why is it different? And with that context, 
what, what are some carriers doing to fix that? And like I had options. There's a lot of press releases out there. There's a lot of articles written on what different carriers have done. Who just scanned the market and written stuff up. Um, that's fine. That's interesting. You know, they're, they're cool stories. But I've been really lucky to build some great relationships across carriers. And where I don't have relationships, I've also been really lucky to just say, well, why don't I try asking? And if they say no, then what have I lost? Because mm -hmm. I'm not talking to them now. Yep. So a mix of people I knew and people that I went out on a limb and asked. I got seven carriers um, that shared firsthand what they did. And so some of it's stuff they've been public about. A few of the things um, are things that actually were in the midst of coming out or they weren't even announcing them yet. So the timing of the book mattered because like I was writing the case before they even announced it to the public. But by the time the book came out, it would be out. Uh, they shared really openly. So this is all firsthand discussions with the actual people at the actual carriers who were doing the things that we talk about, sharing their story, the good, the bad, the learnings, which is another way of saying that, you know, the struggles and what they took from it. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, CSAA insurance groups. So it's the, the biggest AAA carrier, um, the state compensation insurance fund of California, who at one point was the largest comp carrier in the country. And then almost overnight saw their market share drop like, in a heartbeat, yeah. which is about the same way that they became the largest. It was like instantaneously, everyone backed out of California and then some regulations came, changed and then all of a sudden they all came back in. Right. Um, so that's a really interesting situation. And by the way, they're unionized and they have civil servants on their staff. So you wow. talk about constraints, like Skiff faces yeah. constraints, pretty much no other carrier does. And they're part of the California government. Like they are a state entity. Um, we've got CNA. Uh, talking about their work with shift technologies and uh, on fraud and claims. Uh, employers, who's done some really cool things. Another formerly state entity uh, yeah. in a monopolistic state in Nevada that is now a public company and done some really cool things on the API front with their alternative distribution, digital distribution. Um, we have Ohio Mutual, is an amazing mutual carrier based out of Ohio, hence the name. Um, who I'm lucky enough to have gotten to work with firsthand. Uh, that was one of the accounts that I worked on when I was at High Marley. So I got to know that team really well. And we talk about their work with High Marley, which is actually like a 10 year journey to figure out how to text. And there are so many failed attempts and they were just brutally honest about the good and the bad. It sounds um, ridiculous though, right? 10 years yeah. journey to learn how to text, but. Right, but that's, that's why people feel stuck. Is like, I just want to send a text to my insureds and then look what you have to go through. Or there's other carriers that we worked with at High Marley that like they had a solution and they did something wrong with it and like Verizon blocked them from texting any Verizon customers, which is like, you know, a I don't lot. know, 40%, <laughs> like it's yeah, a lot. Yeah. So there's all these missteps, but like they talk about it and they talk about, you know, that could shut us down or we could say, well, why didn't that work? What was missing? What do we figure out through this attempt that makes our needs clearer? So they were fantastic. Um, who else did I, ah, USAA, a uh, little carrier down in Texas. Yeah. Um, and that was the one that everyone's like, oh, no, you, no, USAA won't, they won't do it. They won't participate. They won't tell you anything. They did. Um, and that's not one that I knew someone at, even though I'm actually a USAA member. Um, you know, I've been to conferences with these folks and, and seen them in passing, but I didn't have deep relationships like I did it. Like AXA XL is, is another one that's in the book, and I knew some of the folks there. Um, so yeah, seven carriers, really open, really honest. And from their stories, each one is its own set of learnings. But then across all of them, I aggregate it up. And there are three things that really stand out. Yep. Go. And, Please go. Yeah. I was, that was, that was going to be my next question. What's the, what's the takeaway? And look, this is, this is the trick with writing a book. People are like, well, don't tell the, don't tell the conclusion of it because then no one will buy your book. And my perspective is tell the conclusion of it because if it's interesting and you want more, then great, you you'll get the book. see how they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause there's, there's a lot more to it, but three, basically if I, if I use three single words, it's customers, employees and focus. So customers is exactly that, you know, we started with that pressure from customers Their expectations have changed. She, the, you teed this up really well. And I think it was not this past week, the week before the coverage or like week in review the the chat that you and Sheffy, um, got into about the indifference of customers in the space. Yeah. She put it perfectly. She's like, this is an industry with indifferent customers. If you're working on something they don't want, stop it. So the, the way I would, and it, like, yes, it's a bit um, provocative and, and direct, but it's also true. 
And what I would add to her sentiment is ask them what they want. If you're not engaging with your customers and listening to the answers they give you, you're probably working on the wrong thing. So first and foremost, and you see this across the cases, is you must start with what the customers actually care about or what moves the needle for them. And that's like, that's why Ohio Mutual kept fighting through to figure out how to get texting working. Like, yes, it was better for their staff, but customers kept asking them on claim after claim, like, can I just text you? And to keep having to say no, that doesn't cut it. When you keep hearing, I mean, there, there's like lessons to be learned all over the place. When you keep yeah. hearing the same complaint over and over again, it's a sign. Yeah. Right? Like, and, and we as business professionals, I think we're, we get stuck too often working in the business and not working on the business. And that's part of working on the business yeah. is hearing those things. And like you said, um, customers expect. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, Brian, what happens is the demand sometimes falls off, but it doesn't fall off because there's no demand. It falls off because they don't think they're being heard. Yeah. So it's like, why am I complaining? You know, and those are the worst customers because they're just, they're, their connection to you is so paper thin that any reasonable alternative, anyone that gets in front of them at the right time, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And those same customers, Nick, I think are easy to blow away if you just do things well. If you listen, if you implement, you do some of those simple things that their expectation was that you were going to be terrible. And it's like, oh. That was actually really nice. These are vocal customers. So they can go from being detractors to being promoters if you just listen. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can do everything, but it also doesn't mean you just don't listen because they're a squeaky wheel. Right. So figuring out, you know, figuring out that balance. It's, um, is reminds me of when I was, uh, when I was at Hiscox running claims and we were looking for, uh, different electronic payment providers. Um, one of the largest ones in the industry uh, you know, they're, they're well known, they're great, you know, all good stuff. But I talked to their sales guy and he's telling me about the options you could offer customers. And he's like, you can give them a branded debit card, like with the Hiscox Fleur de Lis on it. And, you know, you can do an e-check and I'm like, uh-huh. I'm wait, like, I'm like, I don't want a debit card because then I'm going to have like 38 cents left on it. And so instead of getting yeah. like, or whatever, like, that's not interesting to me. Um, oh, an e-check. Okay. Like ACH. Okay. Yeah, that's not like, I've, can I just have an electronic, like, can you Venmo it? Can you do Apple pay cash? Like what other options do you have? And so I asked about PayPal because that was something all of their yeah. competitors offered. And his response was, oh yeah, we don't, you don't want to do that because PayPal charges too much for the transaction. I was like, and he's like, well, then we don't, we don't make as much off of it. I was like, yeah, there you go. But customers are asking for it. And your reason for not doing it is because your profit margins thinner, which by the way, you're passing those costs on to me. So it actually doesn't matter to you at all. Um, that's the wrong attitude. And you see that time and again. So if your customers are asking for something, listen. And if they're not asking, why don't you go and ask them? Yeah. Because they have the answer. You're just not engaging with them. Yeah. So that's, that's number one. Is, um, is there a particular area of, so that was one of three, right? One of three, yeah. Okay, so I'm interrupting you. I apologize. No, 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 go, no this is good. M maybe this is part of two or three. Um, uh, but to the effect of customers, um, is there, do you find that the tech is being incorporated in a particular area <clears throat> of the company? Do you find it's mostly claims, mostly distribution, like, where do you, are you seeing traction somewhere that's um, a, a disproportional yeah. to the other areas? Yeah. Well, so look, I have a bias because I was in claims and um, the tech space that I was in when I left Hiscox for High Marley, it was still primarily claims. So there's probably a bit of confirmation bias for me. So I feel like there's a lot going on in claims, but the reality is there's actually a lot going on across the board. There are a few theme, themes that really do stand out. Um, putting the function, like the functional area aside, customer experience is first and foremost. There's no question about that. Things that are focused on how you interact with your customer or how the process of going through whatever that life cycle phase is, whether that's acquisition, 
or renewal or claim or paying a bill, that's where there are tools focused on making the customer's experience, uh, frankly, more like everything else they do in their life. Yeah. Uh, and because they don't expect that, they'll find a light. So like those payment options, when we did a demo with one of them and they paid us each a dollar in my team, well, they paid me a dollar because I was head of claims. They paid all my VPs 50 cents, which I just oh, think is disgusting. Like tr treat your customers equally. Um, Cause they all noticed that, you, you know, yeah. you, you, could, you could bet that. Um, we were all like completely blown away as if we had never heard of like getting money electronically before. We were just totally blown away. So CX enhancements, enablements, improvements with technology that's already out there in every other industry, that's, I think that's first and foremost. There's another theme around advanced intelligence or analytics or data science, AI, ML being applied to making better decisions. So you see that in underwriting, you see that in claims, you see that in marketing. Um, a really cool solution out of California called Pinpoint Predictive. That's um, It's using a bunch of, of data that none of us in the industry has access to, psychometric data, to predict people's propensities to do things. So like your likelihood to take one offer over another, to renew, to lapse, to file a claim, to commit fraud, to anything, even down to like agent's behavior. So can you start to make smarter offers or maybe reach out to someone proactively so you don't lose an opportunity you would have had if you just appealed right. to what they care about? It's really interesting stuff. Um, so using, using data intelligence for smarter, proactive interactions with customers and smarter decision making. Um, so that, you know, that's another area. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that's sort of maybe a bit more cutting edge and a little bit more all over the map, but really cool. It's just a very interesting time that new ideas are coming out. And that includes things like some of the IOT stuff that's going on. You know, customers is like such a, it's so logical, right? And common sense. I'm, I bet though, there are a lot of executives that are just like, Oh yeah, we listen to our customers. Oh yeah. yeah. Like they Everyone think they that. do. Yeah. Everybody thinks they do. Everyone thinks uh, I, I was on the Elevate panel uh, two weeks ago and Bradley Flowers was talking about how every agent he talks to is just like, oh, yeah, we're great at customer service. Oh, yeah. And he's just like, well, how? And then just like, we're just great. Yeah. It's like, but nobody knows how, how they're great. So it's, uh, it's the Lake Wobegon effect. I, I have a feeling a lot of insurance executives think they are much better than average. When it comes to that, and so yeah. uh, is there? I'm going way off track. We're still on point number one here. We need to get <laughs> two and three, but I, I don't want to relinquish it because uh, maybe also some of the problem with tech is that oh well, yeah, it, it becomes this ambiguous thing, just like the customer becomes this ambiguous yeah. thing. But um, maybe that's part three, the focus part. Like, how do you know if you're actually listening to the customer correctly? Type of thing. Yeah. Um, so this, it's not it's not quite part three, but what I would say is there's a, a starting question you need to ask is who's the customer, and this came out especially in the employer's case, um, where and I mean it, it comes out in all of them, but uh, employers made a very conscious decision. I've been at enough carriers or sitting around in a you know consulting meeting with the the decision makers at the carrier about who is the customer. And actually, I think this is one of the reasons why we as an industry have fallen behind because a lot of carriers will say it's the agent or broker. And then the insured is their customer. We, we're not allowed to treat them like our customer because that's not our direct relationship. And it's a threat to the channel if we do that. And some agents and brokers will be defensive about it. And I understand that. Um, but that means the the guys at, at State Compound put this really well. Brokers want something different than a, than an end insured does. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna be meaning that. So they um it's got Dante Robinson, who's the EVP behind their quote and bind solution that we talk about in the book, uh, for their direct business was we had been treating our direct channel customers the same as our brokers. Not our broker customers, our brokers. Because in either either case, like that's the person who's interfacing with SCIF. It's the direct customer or the broker. So they just treated them the same. And he said brokers are saying, transact me. And customers are saying, help me. 
or yeah. insure me. It's yeah. a different thing. And so the, the tools you have to give, the interaction is different. Brokers don't want information. They don't need you to walk them through it. They don't need you to explain things. They just need to be done, right? They want to get the information in, get it processed, click bind and get their money. Totally makes sense. If you treat a customer like that, who doesn't understand comp, who doesn't want to buy it in the first place, but has to, and they're probably, you know, doing it like at night while the TV's going, because that's the only time they had, especially in the small business space, right. you can't tr transact them. You need to transact quickly and efficiently, but you have to do it in a way that supports them and educates them and guides them. You can't overwhelm them because they don't get it. And you can't just brush them off to get the transaction done. It's a different interaction. So if you don't understand who the customer is and, and going back to employers, they, they, made an, they made a decision that some carriers would say, well, that's a cop out, you're not answering it. And I totally disagree. I agree with what employers did is they're all our customers. The insured is our customer, the broker or agent is our customer or the distribution point because this is alternative distribution too. So maybe it's an MGA, maybe it's some third party like affinity group. Um, and what about the injured worker? Because in comp, you have another party involved. You know, it's not a third party claimant. It's a claimant who happens to be a part of your insured's organization. So it's not the same thing as like an adversary. You know, they're not coming in here, maybe committing fraud. Do, like they might be, but this isn't some random person. This is someone who's affiliated with your insured. And so you have to treat them differently and you have to respect their needs because if you get them back to work, that's good for your insured. If you get them back to work, they're less likely to be upset about it. They're less likely to raise a problem with, you know, the HR person or whatever, who's going to make that, uh, right. that decision or, or feed into that decision right. when the renewal comes up. So you can't just worry about the distribution or just the insured or just the injured worker or whoever. You have to be mindful of all of them. And in each one of those customer relationships, there are answers to be had. So that's why the customer focus is so important um, and why it takes a lot more time than people think. So to blow it off is like, oh yeah, we're very good about customers. Ask yourself what that means. Like literally pen to paper, write out who's your customer and how are you good to them? And are there other constituents out there that you, you're serving with your product or in hope of serving directly or indirectly? And how are you doing that with them? Yep. And I guarantee you, if you're willing to be honest, you're going to come to some dead ends or some question marks. That may feel uncomfortable. You may not like that. You may be like, oh, this is nonsense. Like this guy, Falchuk, doesn't know what he's talking about. Or you could say like, oh, this is great. We just unlocked an opportunity. We weren't even thinking about this. Like, look at it that way. This is a stagnant industry by and large. If you unlock a space where you weren't playing before or you weren't playing effectively or interestingly enough to warrant the business, that's a pretty cool opportunity that is very hard to come by because your only other alternative is just discount more and that ain't winning. It, it's either discount more or follow the leaders. Yeah. Right? Have someone else unlock it yeah, and which you're the then time, just on the, the price. you get in there, there's no opportunity left. Yeah. Um, Skiff's CEO of Ernst Satter, who is amazing. I love that guy. He's incredible. Um, he's, he's a lot of fun. He's really interesting. And he's super responsive and on it. Um, when I had written the case and I sent it to him to have a look at, and he's like, you're being too nice. He's like, we failed. We fa like when they went from being the largest in the country to like overnight shrinking dramatically, He's like, you need to say what that is. He's like, we did not deserve the business that we had. We only had it because people had no other alternative. And we never woke up to the fact that they deserve to be served better. And so as soon as they had an option, they fled in droves and we got what we deserved. And it wasn't until we woke up and we started to treat people the way they needed to be treated and the way they're asking to be treated that we got the business back. And they're doing very well today. Yeah. That's really telling. And he was, yeah. I mean, I didn't expect in sending any of the cases in draft form to anyone at the carriers there, they were going to be like, can you please be harsher on us here? But that's just to the point, like they were really honest. Yeah. Um, so uh, executive summary. These, yes. Uh, these companies were excessively focused on listening to the customer. Yeah. And things of that nature. Point number two. Point number two is your people or employees okay. to yes. put it Let's in a single go. word. Yep. So and this is the other one. Um, no doubt the executives in the company are brilliant, have lots of answers, are very capable people, and you don't know everything. And even if you did, 
it's really hard to move an entire organization when no one but you is a part of that answer. So in case after case after case, you'll see a very clear story of the people were part of the solution. And it may not be all the people or it may be all the people. Like for Skiff, they put their literally entire organization through um, design think training. I mean like executive assistants, like everybody went through it and they all participate in projects to come up with ideas. Again, I mean, everybody, USA is not notorious. They're famous for this. They have this tree, the patent tree um, in their headquarters and each leaf is a different patent with the name of the employee whose idea led to that patent. And uh, like, this is a, a famous thing that if you Google it, it's one of the first things that comes up. If you look for USA in patents, a security guard is the, uh, the source of over 25 patents for them. So you might be like, oh yeah, it's the innovation people or it's like a senior underwriter or a claims it's like a person who's like deep in the insurance. No, mm -hmm. a security guard. And I'm not putting down security guards. I'm just saying it's literally everybody. So that's to the point that like when you engage your people on the idea of moving the organization forward, that's great. That's step one. Because if you engage them, they have ideas and you're like, okay, thanks. Now back to what I thought we should do then you've done that all for nothing. So the carriers engage their people, take the ideas and do something with it. So State Comp Fund, their people came up with, I think it was 30 ideas through these series of like design think challenges that they had. 18 of them are either implemented or in production right now. And it's not to say the other 12 weren't considered, but like I think 18 out of 30, I don't know carriers who have that hit rate for like innovative ideas that get deployed that's pretty awesome. And that just came from the people. And the story keeps repeating itself across different carriers where the people were the ones asking for it. Like Ohio Mutual, they had the customers asking to text on the one hand. And when they tried things, they had their people being like, look, this isn't cutting it for us, or this is good, but that's not working yeah. for us. And they listened to all that and they were fine. And that story goes on and on and on where the engagement of the people was so critical. I have been at carriers that label themselves all these things. Like you were saying, you know, where all the people are like, oh, we're great with customers. And the other one is like, we're non-hierarchical. Well, everyone says that. That's a great recruiting pitch. The vast majority don't actually, or we're a meritocracy is the other one. It's like, maybe, maybe not. I was at a carrier who sang that praise up and down about themselves. And they could not have been further from that. They would start an all yeah. hands meeting about the new core system they were deploying. And the CEO started with, we're behind schedule. I don't want a single question about it. No one is allowed to speak in this meeting. Like he, he killed people's ability to raise their hand or come off mute. And it's like, well, how do you think they're going to feel about engaging in these conversations when you start the conversation by silencing them? It's, um, this way we I feel like in all these points we're going to keep coming full circle because it's common sense but it's not so common right it's um, I will guarantee you that almost all executives will have some will feel as though they have been uh, beneficial or benevolent to their employees but that's not exactly what you're talking about this isn't being nice yeah. This is more of like um, what you described on the customer side. It's um, giving your employees a voice in the operation and, and understanding that if you don't, um, it's going to be really difficult for you to keep the ship moving or get the ship moving in the direction that you want it to yeah. if they're paddling the wrong way. And they can do it in so many different subtle ways that it could, it, it could basically you know, dis disrupt what's going on. Yeah. Um, if, if they're not fully engaged in what it is you're doing. And I think part of it is it, it can boil down to resentment too, right? Yeah. Like oh, completely. You, you're, you're, you're putting this burden on us to have these production levels, these, you know, KPIs you need to produce to this level, but you're not giving us the tools to be able to do that. And we don't even have a voice in the a vote or a voice in the tools. You guys just haphazardly decide what's best for us and then say, okay, produce yeah yeah it's crazy and, uh, and yeah no you're absolutely right and going back to the first point about customers you don't forget if you're in the c-suite how close to the customers are you and maybe you go far, far away like strategic accounts or you have that big broker but like 
it's your people who are actually yep. at the coal face. And that's a point, you know, I have people outside the carriers as well, like Jeff Goldberg from Novarka um, gave me some thoughts in the book. And one of the points that he raised was uh, for a lot of carriers, because they're intermediated and they saw that as the end of the customer journey for them, it was the agent or the broker, they were too far removed from what the customers were asking for. So don't replicate that same false barrier internally by only letting the senior people come up with the path forward when it's your line folks and people up and down the levels that are actually the ones yeah. who are yeah. talking to the customers every day, yeah. seeing yeah, what their needs are and their issues. It, it's like the beginning of time, you know, with, um, I'll, I'll use like a war analogy because it's the front line folks, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's been common since the beginning of time that like, senior military people, the ones that are successful, listen to the frontline folks. Frontline folks say something's happening, then something's happening. Yeah. You know, and, um, and again, I, I think it's circ- a, a lot of where we are as an industry circles back to, we think we're doing these things. We think we're listening to the customer. We think we're doing the right things by the employees. These are common sense stuff, which is really funny, right? Because you're talking about innovation. Right. But it, you're, I, I have a feeling a lot of what we're going to find in your book boils down to uh, the ability we're going to get into focus now, the ability to focus on more fundamental common sense things yeah. that will, will produce the seed that are seeds for, for innovation. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about focus. Yes, let's do it. This this is uh, this is an interesting one. And, you know, I think the audience of the book is, is probably mostly folks at carriers. But I also had my insure tech brethren in mind, brethren and sistren. I don't know if that's the word for it, um, but it, the the folks there, um, because for startups, the number one problem is shiny object syndrome, yep. and it's very similar in innovation because there's so much out there, and you don't know what's what. And you know, you'll notice I haven't like none of the top three the, these takeaway points is like SaaS or blockchain or APIs. Like that's all in there, but that's not what this book is about. It's not about technology. It's about solutions and how you get to them. And so the last case is USA and theirs is a little different from the others. The others are all about a specific innovation in a specific area of the business, you know, like texting and claims or uh, CSAAs is using ride sharing in place of rental car coverage in auto which um, may not sound like a big deal to people, but three and a half years ago when they did it, like they worked with Lyft. Lyft was so much smaller than they are now. Ride sharing was not, I mean, yes, it was somewhat common, but not to the extent it is now. Cabs were definitely still a powerhouse. Um, Lyft was something like a 30th the size they are now. Um, so, you know, it, it, was, it was different. USAA's innovation is they innovated on innovation. So the story there, and it's a great one to end the cases on, is it's about how they, they had an innovation function and they made a decision that, you know what, this is great, but it's not actually serving where we think things are going and we're missing out on something. So we need to augment it and change its remit a bit. So they spread it out. They kept their core central innovation, but added some specific functional innovations. So that one for the auto product, for the homeowner's product, and then for claims. So kind of underwriting product and claims for the insurance side. Now, they have other businesses as well, but on the, the PNC space. Yeah. Um, and their portfolio projects, like a lot of carriers see, was very technology focused. So for example, like I mentioned blockchain, you'll see, and this, this came up uh, in, a, in a Slack group today, it was like, what happened to blockchain? That's all anyone was talking about in like three years ago, and where is it? Well, when you lead with a technology, you may not actually be solving for anything or you may miss the right way to solve it. So USA went through their portfolio of all their projects and anytime it was about a technology like AI adjusting or you know, I'm making this up, like whatever it is, they killed it. And they said, everything in our portfolio needs to be about a problem we're solving or an opportunity we're going after. So it's not AI adjusting, it's um, how do we shorten the cycle for people to get back on the road? Right. Um, for for the Lyft solution that CSA built, it wasn't uh, this guy Brian Gab who I interviewed for the book. I know Brian. Was, yeah, good guy. yeah, great guy. Really, really honest and helpful. Um, what he said is, we had been for years making the rental car experience better and done a great job at that. And but ultimately, 
when you ask the question is like, how can we make rental cars smoother? Like renting a car, how can we make that smoother? Every answer you come up with will be about renting a car. But customers aren't saying my car got an accident or I got in an accident, my car's out of commission, I need to rent a car. They're saying, I need a car, I need to get from here to there. So the way he said it was, then I just asked, customers are trying to solve for getting from A to B. Yeah. What if we phrase it like that? Then we can come up with anything. It's not about making rental cars faster and easier or like trimming the return process time. It's about getting customers to where they're trying to get to. That's a problem. Rental cars are a technology, if you will. Depends on the, maybe how bad the car is, but. Yeah, well that's, that's um, I, I don't know um, whether, uh, who's the, Who's the innovation, the Harvard, Harvard Business School guy that just died? Clay, um, oh, when you said just died, then I'm like, well, I don't know if he died. I was going to say Clay Christensen, but I don't Clay know. Clay Christensen, yeah, he did yeah, die. He did. Okay. Yeah, he did recently. Um, oh. he, 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 I, think, I think it was him that was saying uh, people don't buy drills or drill bits. Right. Uh, you know, they, they want need to make they, a hole. They need to make a hole. Yeah. Right? Like, that's what they want. Like, that's what the – that's the, the ultimate solution that they yeah. need uh, for that. He's so and, not a dad though. Cause I but, would totally go and look at drills for hours. And even if I didn't have it, <laughs> Well, I mean, cool. we, we, you and I both have a, uh, you know, fascination with certain types of technologies, but yes. uh, we're, you know, we're the exception to the rule. And I think the rule is most of the time it's just like, I just need to hang something. Yeah. I just need a hole in the wall or whatever. Um, but it's similar, right? Like yeah, that's totally. Like, what do we, what do we, ultimately, it's what are we talking about here? And um, when it comes to focus, when, you t when these companies that were doing innovation groups, do they do any, did you, were they able to expose on, um, you know, off sites, uh, working, working around like thought experiments and, you, you mentioned design, yeah, uh, design, design processes. Yeah. Like, how do you bust out of, this is how we do things and you yeah. can't, you can't even imagine a world outside of rental cars or holes in walls. Yeah. Um, so they talk about that a little bit, um, especially the AXA XL case where they, they used a methodology um, that the president of their construction business, which is where I focus, uh, this guy, Gary Kaplan, he had started at his prior company, a uh, consultant came in and taught them this thing called RRI. It's rapid results initiatives and it's effectively design thinking with a very clear structure. So you turn everything to this 90 day project, um, which they go into all of that. Like, how do you make that work? And they started to use it for their pilots, which means like they brought customers into those projects and the customers had to live by the 90 day cycle, um, which you would think like, oh, we can't do that. Actually the customers are like, this is so much better. We know exactly what we have to do and when we're gonna be done with it. And like, we can take people off their job because it's fixed time versus like, yeah, we'll do this project with you. And, you know, six months later, they're still in it. And they're not, they were like, we can dedicate resource to it. We can get it done. We can see if it worked. And if it did, then there's a step two. And if it didn't, then we move on. Um, so they go into that. What I would say is this is an area with a lot of help out there. Um, you know, there's a company like Cake and Arrow comes to mind as an amazing shop that helps with that kind of thing. They actually ran a workshop at a conference I was at. I don't think I've ever had in like an hour, hour and a half session as clear a sense of what design think is and get the whole like, you know, 80 of us from insurance really humming on it. Um, so, you know, shout out to Cake and Arrow, right, rightfully so. They did a great job with that. But there are lots, lots of places like that. So you can bring some people in to learn these things and you do like what's gifted where you can then broaden that out to the whole company and you can have real expertise in your innovation team. Um, or like Brian Gabb's team is strategy and innovation. Like they're all design think people. Um, Brian's boss actually had been a consultant before that and ran a, like a, an accelerator program for us at Hiscox that was all design think based. So like we lived in this teeny little space in San Francisco, like very startup-y. Um, and, uh, and, and she taught us all how to do this. So like, I know they have those skills in house, but there are those people out there. So you can bring it in. Um, and there's a very specific way to go about it that really brings people back to opening their mind and thinking about the problem or the opportunity rather than like, we found this technology that I heard about at a conference. What do I do with it? Like, oh, you try to fit it in. So 
when you, when you start with a problem and you stay focused on, and I say problem, but it could be opportunity too, and you stay focused on that, that helps keep you from fluttering all over and looking at different right. stuff. Um, case in point, uh, employers with their APIs, they were very purposeful that like, it has to produce a quote and the quote's got to get bindable. And we're going to hear lots of other things people want it to do. And there's going to be different functionality and different ways it could work. And like, oh, we want it to present this way and we like it this way. We have to stay really true to that intent. And this is where focus becomes so critical. And same thing from the Axe XL stories or CNA, really any of them. Um, they kept getting feedback from a very defined set of early adopter distributors that they were working with. And they purposely limited that. They're like, we can only deliver this. So we're going to work with this number of people and we'll have others that we're talking to, but like two for go live. And we're going to stay to that core. And when we hear ideas that are a little bit off, we're going to take it back to the group. And unless it has universal appeal, we're not going to do it because we're not going to get, any, get into the business of customizing the solution over and over and over again right. for each person's new idea. And having been at a startup, it's really hard when you have carriers who could potentially be, you know, a marquee customer for you and you want their logo and your sales stuff and, um, you know, the, the revenue matters and they're asking you for something you can't do. And you're like, can we divert all of our six engineers or however small your team is to make this happen? Yeah. What's the cost of it? Could you talk to them about like, that's a fantastic idea. We'd like to spend more time with you to really understand that so that we can make something of it when we have capacity for it and then we can slot it in our development plans and make sure we get it right. Cause invariably when you jump on it like that, you're not going to get it right. And it's going to take right. you three times as much resource as you thought it would. So stay focused. And the trick with this one is you still need to be open to other ideas. You still need to be open to better solutions that are out there. So it's not like blinders, but you need to stay focused on the problem or the opportunity. So you can make sure that's what you're delivering to. It doesn't mean scope doesn't change. It doesn't mean new technology doesn't come up, but you need to know why you're doing it in the first place. And that I think is, is the, you know, the customer focus, the employee focus is important. Once you have those and you know your ideas, the thing that will do you in and take you off track and lead you to what we tend to think of when we think of these projects of going on forever and costing so much more and delivering so much less is because we lose our way and we lose our engagement with it. And the business relegates it to IT and stops caring. Stay focused, stay on point, stay on message with people who are bought in because your customers wanted you to do it. That's how you're going to move forward. And it's also how you, you can brand too, right? Like when you're that focused on, let's say like one particular solution, um, especially if you can execute on it, you, you become well-known, yeah. right? Like it's, it's like they can do this. They can, yeah. do, they can, you know, um, and, and that, I think that also helps within the, within the organization too. It's like a victory within the organization, knowing that, Hey, we set ourselves, um, you know, the, the, even the rank and file employee, we set out to do this and we executed on it. We're capable. We know, yeah. we know how to do this. We can do this again. Yes. We can keep doing this. Yeah. Um, are there any lessons around, um, what I just described, which is you, you innovate, like take a carrier, let's any, any carrier, uh, they decide to do something positive. They decide to innovate. They do innovate. Mm. They are successful. Then what? Yeah. Then it just happens once and they're done. Right. That's, right? that's what you want to avoid is you're trying to build, um, and this sounds silly or cliche, but the culture of innovation, you need this to replicate. And that's, that's why those are the three takeaways and not like be mindful of cloud solutions. And be, because who, I mean, it's hard to imagine it's that those won't exist, but like, yeah, it's irrelevant. Yeah. So, so I, I'm launching the book at connected claims on the 24th. Um, or actually now I think it's the 23rd, but either way, I spoke at the first connected claims in 2017 when I was at Hiscox and Everyone else is talking about drones and whatnot, and I was talking about people connection. So I was a little bit weird on stage, but I was talking about the cultural bit. Like claims cannot exist in a vacuum; it has to be connected to underwriting and product and HR. And I like you can't actually succeed without that. 
Because if claims doesn't know what's getting underwritten, how do they know what's going to happen as claims? And if they're not feeding back to underwriting product, then are you ever going to get your policies right? Like, oh, we keep denying these claims that I think we meant to cover. We should change our wording. Or like, did you even realize this was the exposure you were writing? We need to think right. about that differently. Right. You have to stay connected there. And, you know, I can go on for all the other departments. Someone was like, you shouldn't do this. I was like, well, why? And they're like, because that's kind of Hiscox's secret sauce. Or at least when I was there, like that's what we felt like our connection, our culture was unique. And that's why we were able to execute the way we did. And I was like, you know what? I'm not really worried about it because I don't think most people are really going to take it in because of what you said. They'll be like, oh, yeah, we're, we're already integrated. In it. We listen to our customers beautifully. Yeah. We t our underwriters and claims people talk every day. No, they don't. They talk at the water cooler, but they're in their cubicles or their offices or on different floors or different buildings. They're not really integrated. Yeah, only only at the the annual offsite. Right. right. And and even then, they're still like and my team yeah. has come. They're on one side of the room, and yeah. the underwriters they're are like, on the other, and the executives are over right, there. The holiday party. It's like. Why are six adjusters like crowded around this three person table? Because like three of you could be off talking to someone else. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's no different. So here is another one of these cases. If you're really open to it, if you really want it, it does mean a change. It means an openness. It means uh, getting rid of ego or hubris. So I think for startup carriers, it's hubris. I think for incumbent carriers, it's ego. Where you ha need to say like, actually, you know what? I don't know everything but I bet you if I open up to my people and I just listen, we will start to, as an organization, know everything and in the process, start to change the way we feel about these thoughts and we may actually be able to keep doing this because none of these examples is a carrier who's done it once. There's no one who's only had one innovation. They have created an ability to keep moving forward. Right. And that is about engaging in these three key things. Wow, awesome message. We went- Thanks. Uh, almost an hour and I feel like I want more, which I can get more. I can you buy can, a book. You can get more. Yes. So, um, how is, I'm assuming it has it, when's it, when's the release date? So it comes out on the 24th of June, but okay. it's available now, uh, for pre-order and, uh, it's coming out in every format you could possibly want. Um, but people can just go to future dash of dash insurance.com. There's okay. a little pre-order button. Um, but yeah, however you want it, ebook, paperback, audiobook, whatever, I got you covered. Um, some who's, are up for pre-order. Some will be out on the 24th. Whose voice for the audiobook? Uh, mine. Oh, it's perfect. Well, for any, no one, no one likes the sound of their voice. So I don't know too many people who would say that, but um, I get a lot out of it. And I think from an editing standpoint, when you read something out loud, you hear it very differently than it yeah. sounds in your head. And so I actually think I've always read my own books for audio, for uh, Audible. I think it's really critical. Yeah. I missed, I missed the comma there. Got to go back and put that comma. Yeah. Um, this was awesome. If you're listening, um, I will put all of that information in the show notes uh, for you. But um, so excited. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for no. believing in this literally from the very start. It, it truly the future of insurance, which is uh, in, in a lot of ways back to its back to fundamentals in, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and the, and the, the lessons we can learn from technology is just how to innovate and kind of bring those in versus just slamming technology. And I, I love the message. Yeah. That's great. So, Thank you, Nick. Uh, Brian, thanks a lot uh, for everyone. Show notes. As usual, please stay safe. The pandemic is not over. Continue to wash your hands. Continue to be smart. Uh, we can do this. So uh, to everyone, Brian, thank you. Everyone that's listening, thank you. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.